We're reading this morning from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? And he asked them, What things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back and told us they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into glory? Then beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to, his, to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? At that same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open our hearts to hear you, O Lord. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. As it says in the scriptures, Emmaus was about seven miles east of Jerusalem. And that morning, Cleopas and another companion that we don't know were walking back to Emmaus after the Passover. They were walking back home and they were discussing the things that had gone on as they walked. And a stranger came up to them joined them in their walking. And he said to them, what are you talking about? And they said, we're we're talking about the things that happened this week in Jerusalem. And he said, what things are you talking about? They said, you're the only person in the world who doesn't know what happened in Jerusalem this week, how they took and crucified Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, oh, you foolish one. Don't you understand that the Christ had to come and had to be sacrificed? Don't you understand that? And he began to teach them the scriptures. You know, it's important. I believe in a high view of scripture. I believe that we have to respect and honor the tradition of the church and of of the scriptures. John Wesley said, I am a man of one book, and by that book he meant the Bible. Now, he had an extensive library, but that's what, the, that's what it went to. The, the scriptures were 
the main important thing in his life. Scripture is important in our life, in the life of the church. It's a guideline. It's a guidebook. It's a set of, of guidelines for us, a set of rules. The rules don't save us, but they give us an idea of what we're supposed to do as Christian people. You know, as Christians, we are called to love and care for each other, to be kind and supportive and loving and generous people. That's what we're called to do and be, and that's what it says in our scriptures. And Jesus went all the way back to Moses, and he began to talk about the things that led up to the Messiah. If they had read the book of Isaiah, they would know that the servant who came, the, the king who came as the servant would suffer, would be beaten. His blood would be spilled. His blood would be poured out. They would have understood that. They had read the book of Isaiah and studied it. I think today one of the most important things we do in the church is, is educate. We have Sunday school for a reason. First of all, it's a small group where, where you can come and talk with your friends and about things in the week and things that are going on in, in your life and be supported by them. That's what Sunday school is about. But it's also about studying the scriptures and learning the scriptures because that's important. We believe that it's important to do so. They were taught as they walked along the road. Jesus taught them about the prophets and the things that the prophets said and did that showed how the Messiah was to come. He didn't come as a political leader with charisma. He didn't come as a military leader with a sword and a shield. He came as a poor carpenter's son. He came in poverty. He came in humble circumstances. The people that were around him when he was born were shepherds. They came and they worshipped him. Not the important people. He wasn't born in a, in a castle or an elaborate house. He was born in a stall, in a stable, laid in the manger. That was the king that was to come. And they didn't recognize him because they were looking for something else. And that's why he was crucified, because he was different. He was different from the other Messiah that they had in their mind, in their brain. He was different from them. Jesus taught them as they walked along about the scriptures and pointed out to them all of these things that the servant must do how the servant would come, as I said, in humble circumstance. He would come and begin his ministry not as a king, not as a soldier, not as a politician, but as an itinerant preacher who traveled around, walking wherever he went. Which reminds me of a, an old preacher story. You may have heard it before there was a young man who turned 15 and was time to get his, this happened back in the 60s guy at 15 you could get your scripture then uh, get your uh, license then so at 15 he went to his father and said I've got my license now and and um, I, I'd really like it if you'd buy me a car the father said well I tell you what you uh, keep your grades up get your grades up and get your hair cut, and um, we'll, we'll get you a car. 
So he came back about nine months later and he said, Dad, look at my grades here. Here they are, A's and B's. I pulled all my grades up. He said, yeah, but you didn't get a haircut. He said, yeah, Dad, I've been thinking about that. You know, Jesus had long hair. And he said, yes, and he walked everywhere he went. Yeah, uh, I could live that out in my life anyway. But Jesus came as the suffering servant who bridges the gap between us and the holiness of God. Jesus came to fulfill the prophecies of how the servant would be taken and beaten, and hurt, and crucified. He died a terrible, horrible death. Death on the cross. Shameful. Shameful death. And Jesus came and fulfilled those prophecies. And they didn't understand. Finally, they came to the man's house in Emmaus. And Jesus acted like he was going on. And they said, no. Cleopas said, no. Come and and stay at my house and and eat with us. It's almost dark. So come come and eat with us. And so Jesus went inside and, and he reclined at the table, and they brought the food in. And as he was lying there, he, he took the bread, and he broke it. And when he did that, they saw who he was, and he disappeared. It was made known to them, it says, in the breaking of bread. When we have our communion service and we break the bread together, when we do that, we see Christ. Christ is with us in a very special way in that communion service. Christ is with us in a very special way to love us and care for us and we can see Christ in that bread, and grape juice that we share together. It's a great thing to be able to know that Christ is still among us. And we see that in the breaking of the bread. I have a... Had, when I was in Atlanta, um, I... Um, worked with a couple of Jewish people uh, sh- selling stride right shoes. And we got into a religious discussion one day. Um, now you got to understand, these guys go to Hebrew school and they read the Bible and they learn to read it in Hebrew. And, and that was beyond me. I mean, Greek was tough enough, but I definitely wasn't going to try to learn Hebrew. And he had studied some of the scriptures in Hebrew Hebrews, and we would talk, and uh, we got around to talking about, he said, tell me about communion, what you do when you have communion together. And I said, well, we break the bread as a symbol of the brokenness of the Christ. And he said, do you believe that it becomes the true body of Christ? I said, no, not as a United Methodist, we don't believe that. But we do believe that God is with us in a very special way when we break the bread. We don't believe it really becomes the body or the uh, grape juice, the blood. We just believe that there is something there. There There is some special way that God is with us during that time. And he said, how great it is. How Man, that's, that's great. You're actually eating your God. That's pretty profound, isn't it? 
when you think about it like that. We are blessed by the communion elements and we recognize Christ in those elements, in the things that He does for us, in the things that He brings us to. God comes and welcomes us to receive the elements. You know, the weird thing about this story, besides the fact that they couldn't uh, see who He was, and we can explain that away, because... Jerusalem was, I mean, Emmaus was east of Jerusalem and they were walking into the sun so maybe they didn't recognize him because of that. Maybe he had a hood on. We don't know. Maybe some uh, supernatural thing that Jesus did kept them from seeing who he was. I don't know. Not going to explain it away. Just a mystery. Don't understand. But we know that He came for us. He came to see us. And He's coming back again to get us and receive us into His kingdom and into His glory. He was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And it says after He disappeared, immediately they got up and went back to Jerusalem. You realize what that means? They jumped up from the supper table and they went to Jerusalem in the dark. And it was hazardous traveling in the dark. They didn't have cars with headlights. They didn't have lamps and lanterns. They had torches. We're not told that they had any of that, but they returned to Jerusalem and said, we've seen the Lord. And they said, guess what? So have we. We, do, we've, we have too. And they discussed what went on. The thing I need to tell you this morning is even as he came in humbleness as a child, he'll return again in glory as the king of earth. Are you ready in your heart to receive the king? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for the grace that you showed us through Jesus Christ. Help us to always be ready and looking for you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.